so uh, let's start this today's lecture so it's kind of continuation of yesterday lecture itself uh, most of the things we have covered on linear linear regression yesterday uh, but some of the thing which was left that i'll cover in this class as well as the correction which we made that i'll discuss and uh, apart from that uh, all the metrics which was left la last class in the last class that we will discuss in this lecture okay so quickly i'll go to the part where which we have corrected all right so yesterday we were having discussion on this right uh where we have this gradient descent equation like loss function equation and based on that uh like uh, it was getting differentiated and on basis that like uh, what how your uh, parameters are going to change how uh, like gradient descent into gradient descent will change on each iteration what will be your uh, beta or beta not or beta one so this was the loss function here and then uh, the correction which we made was in this particular equation in these two equation so yeah so here it will be uh, minus 1 by n uh, summation of y minus beta naught plus beta 1 x right so if you differentiate this uh, i'll just show it here uh, 1 by 2 n right uh, the loss function here is 1 by 2 n right and then summation of i 1 to n y minus beta naught beta naught plus beta 1 x right and square so this is the equation and now when you differentiate it with respect to beta naught so let's say this is the function u df by or let's say write it like dj itself dj by uh, partial differentiation with respect to beta naught so in that case uh, your uh, like this you will have one one by two n multiplied by two right and then in bracket you will have this summation it will be there and then y minus beta naught plus beta 1 x right and then again this equation will be differentiated so in that case it will uh, minus 1 will come right because when you are doing partial differentiation this term is gonna get 0 this will also be 0 just this beta naught will be differentiated with respect to beta naught so the final will be here you will get minus 1 so your final result will be 2, 2 will be cancelled out and minus 1 by n, right? And then summation of i to n and y minus beta naught plus beta 1 x, right? And this is what it is written here. Similarly, in the second equation, when we do this with respect to, let's say, uh, the same function uh, with respect to beta 1, right? So d of j with respect to d of beta 1. So in that case, again, everything will come 1 by 2n multiplied by 2, right, summation. And again, y minus uh, beta naught plus beta 1x. This will be here, right? Just one thing will change that this will cancel out when we are uh, doing partial differentiation with respect to beta 1. So this beta naught will be canceled out again when we are differentiating, right? Uh, y will be canceled out just this beta 1x uh, with respect to beta 1. So it will come out minus x right so this is what it is written here 2 2 will be cancelled out again and minus will be here so that is why we have here uh, minus 1 wait a second yeah so minus 1 and minus 1 by n and uh, in the end you have x multiplied by x all right so this is what uh, we did the correction we corrected it the misprint was there in the material and uh, similarly, this equation, same equation uh, will be repeated here. These two equations, this has also been changed. All right. A uh, few questions were left from the last class, right? Uh, that was on VIF, what is R square? So that I'll discuss in the end. Uh, first, let me uh, discuss the matrix part, the metric where uh, I'll explain what is R square and on basis that what is VIF, I'll uh, explain later. So let's directly jump to here, data preparation part. So in this also one thing was left, 
uh, if I remember it correctly, uh, this rescaling of input, uh, this was left. So in this case, uh, what I uh, last class, what example I gave, uh, that was around, let's say I have uh, multiple things like a sales data is, uh, you want to predict for sales, let's say. So for that, I have uh, various, uh, various variables, right? Like, uh, like what, how much I'm investing on TV advertisement uh, or radio advertisement, right? Or kind of newspaper advertisement, right? So these all factors might be there, which will predict your sales, right? This kind of marketing, if I just want to look based on that, like how much sales it is happening, uh, if I want to predict, so this will be different, different values. Now uh, for regression, uh, one thing you need to look out, like what is the range of each of the variables? So let's say for TV advertisement, if it is showing that, okay, your uh, range of uh, values in that particular column, if that is, let's say between 1 million to 50 million, okay, for TV ads, for radio ads, it might, might be like uh, from 100K to 200K, let's say, your range of value, right? For newspaper, it might be 50K to 100K, right? So you can see here for all these variables, you have a different scaled values, right? So one value is from 1 million to 500 million for radio, it is 100 to 200 for newspaper as it is like 50 to 100K. So for uh, like when you are doing the data preparation or data pre-processing for which will, uh, when you will create, when you will pre-process data, that data, pre-processed data, clean data will go inside the model for the linear regression algorithm, right? If you are applying linear regression. So in that case, when you are doing the pre-processing, these all steps you need to cover, like linear assumption, you need to check, outliers, you need to check and remove those uh, things you need to decide on, whether you want to remove it or kind of mask it or n number of things you can do in case you know, if you want to do that. Like the simple thing is like you can, if you know for sure that these are uh, outliers and you do want to, don't want to keep it for your model, so you will uh, remove this, right? Again, remove collinearity and everything. Last part is, let's say, rescaling. So these all uh, value ranges are there. What you will do for rescaling? You will, uh, for each column, there are two methods which are generally applied. One is standardization and one is normalization. All right? Standardization and normalization. The standardization, may, uh, what we do, like, uh, let's say there is one column X. All right? So what... If we say that, okay, this is rescaled for any column, this is X, I denote it uh, for that particular column. So this is like rescaled. What we will do, we will do X minus X mean divided by X max minus X mean. All right. So this will bring down your whole column values between zero to one. This will be the same column. Let's say if I want it for TV ads, right? So this will be X TV ad minimum of that column and then uh, divided by x max of that column minus x mean of that column. So you will apply this and this then your column will be rescaled. Uh, the same another uh, like this, this is a different type of here. Uh, it's kind of uh, you can say no it just just let me correct it once. Uh, this is not standardization just it will be reversed. This is normalization and next what I am going to explain this is standardization just to exchange it. Yeah. So this is normalization. When you are doing X minus X mean by X max minus X mean, this is your normalization formula. When you are standardizing it, it's kind of, you are making it standard normal, right? So it's in this case, what you will do X minus mu by Sigma, right? This is X value for each value. You will uh, minus it with, you will subtract it with the mean of that uh, particular column and divide it by variance of that particular column. So it will give you rescale standard values in this case. And normalization is something which I explained it earlier that will be X minus X mean divided by X max minus X mean. Right? So these are two methods. Uh, in most of the cases, we use this normalization where X minus X mean uh, divided by X max minus X mean, this formula is being applied. Uh, also like in linear regression, standardization is also being followed, but it depends on your use case. Sometimes uh, for a model, uh, when you are doing normalization, your model will not perform better. But uh, when you are doing standardization, it starts to perform better. That happens. So it's kind of uh, like uh, you need to do try and error in this case. 
like first do normalization and then check for the error whether it is decreasing or not uh, then again for standardization you do and then again check it so in that case you can have you have to uh, like try and then experiment and then again come back to finalize the things hello uh, hello alok uh, yes yes uh, sorry for interrupting uh, in the steps of pre processing uh, we are not considering the dummy variables making of uh, cl- no categorical column yeah so here uh, dummy variable is common for all machine learning algorithms right for all algorithms you you are going to do this but this is this data preparation of linear regression it is specifically for linear regression what all things you need to cover right okay on top okay, of thanks. that there are, yeah on top of that there will be n number of pre processing steps uh, which we are going to tell you so those things will be applied like transforming uh, like one hot encoding kind of thing or like uh, masking and everything there are a lot of things which you can do okay okay thank you okay cool so uh, next thing is uh, okay so let's now jump to the next topic which is regression model evaluation metrics okay so inside this uh, what basically why we need model model evaluation metrics right so this is the last part so in the start what you will do you will have a data right you will have a data set like in form of csv or in any form let's say you are querying uh, using sql from the database and you have you have got the data and you, let's say you have created the data frame out of it right in your python python notebook now once you have the data frame the next step would be to do the pre process right once your pre processing step is done then this data the cleaner data the pre process data that will go inside the algorithm that is linear regression algorithm itself and post that your linear regression algorithm uh, that will learn all the parameters right and when i say parameters these are all beta not beta 1 and everything like it depends on number of variables like let's say if you have 10 variables so there will be 11 parameters in this case right so beta not to beta 10 right there will be 11 parameters now once your parameter once your algorithm has been trained right you have the results now right now you get your prediction on a validation data right so these things i think i think already been covered like you have trained data you have validation data right trained data you train your algorithm and then your on validation data you predict to check whether your model is working fine or not right or whether this model is better than your previous model or not right so for that you need some number it should not it will not be like you will just look at the parameter and you will decide there will be something which you will look to decide whether this model is performing better or whether we should go ahead uh, with this particular model for the business use cases for deployment so that is for that we need these evaluation metrics and very simple to think like uh, error error will be your one of your metric right you should check the error whether using this model you have the less error or previous model has that right so in that case there are various things which is being used in various various uh, like situations so these are very commonly used uh, matrices uh, metrics which we use to calculate error in the model so these are specific to regression uh, next thing will classification will come so there is a different set of uh, metrics which we check for classification but here it is these all are for regression right and i'm pretty sure like i'll just give you what is regression and what is classification so regression independent variable you will have all numerical values right so kind of like sales data example here so sales data uh, like numerical values you uh, you will get like uh, 0.05 million or 1 million or 2.6 million so kind of this you will get the numerical data in your dependent variable but when it comes to classification you can have either uh, like binary classification zero and one whether this is cat or dog or it can be like uh, multi class classification so that like that is what classification is but in that like there will not be a continuous type of uh, numerical values there will be discrete 0 1 0 1 2 3 4 5 kind of okay so yeah so these model evaluation metrics uh, metrics these are uh, specifically for regression where you have numerical values so the few uh, metrics are there those are msc mean squared error rmsc ma map r square and adjusted r square and we are going to discuss discuss one by one okay so mean squared error it's very uh, it's basically very in, uh, intuitive and we have already seen that so it's kind of this the formula uh, you have predicted 
you have predicted values right which your model has given you have actual values so you will just do y minus y hat which is your residual right you square it out uh, why we have squared it uh, that we already discussed yesterday right uh, but uh, can you just give me answer quickly like why we have squared it if you remember the last class yes for differential for differentiation or one one more thing is there to remove the negative residual it's not like that to not to remove the negative residual it's kind of both are not getting uh, you know cancelled out you have negative residual you have positive residual but both are your errors right so in that case we are not removing negative residual we are just ha uh, yes not to cancel out exactly yes so that's the case that is why we are doing the square and we are doing 1 by n and that is your mean squared error okay right so this is what mean squared error is let's quickly go to the next one okay so it's kind of like uh uh just a root mean squared error so whatever you had like msc uh, in msc just you what you will do you will just put the root of it right it's kind of uh, like just you are put pulling down your uh, values right you are pulling down your values and in that case uh, just to look at the smaller numbers right uh, your error might be let's say if it is in 1000 1200 1300 so it's kind of just uh, like making it kind of in a you know uh, in, in in the in it's kind of in a range of where you can evaluate and you can look into right that is one use case of it like it's from 1000 10000 you just doing the square root because whenever you are doing the square, square root uh, it's pretty much you will get the square root value but nothing else change, changes right your msc if something is lower if you are comparing to models model 1 model 2 uh, if you are doing the square root for both of the mscs uh, pretty much you can compare now also right it's like almost same value when you are comparing msc you'll just doing the square root and you are uh, like uh, just putting it here right in a like uh, definable range okay uh, so yeah so in this case uh, in most of the it, it is preferred in more in the cases because error are first square be before averaging which poses a high penalty on errors right so in this case like uh, wherever uh, when you are doing the square uh, squaring it so in that case you are pen, uh, giving more high penalty to large errors right when you are doing the square this will be helpful when we will uh, see the next one the next metric but yes when you are doing uh, ssc or msc in this uh, case you are put, put, uh, putting like large values uh like large penalty on large errors right like because that is going to be square right one thing is here like uh, this root mean square is the most commonly used metric so you will uh, really see msc or ssc because those are like rmsc is derived from those itself so that's why like uh, most in most cases you will are going to report rmsc itself like when you are running a regression model uh, so in that case you will report rmsc so that's the most common uh, like metric which you are going to evaluate right then uh, next comes here this is mean absolute error so yeah so this is again uh, pretty intuitive like instead of error we are taking absolute values right and uh, this point you need to look out so it's not suit suitable for applications where we want to pay more attention to the outliers right so in case of uh, when you are squaring it what i was telling you like when you are squaring it uh in case of outlier you will have large value of error right outlier what your model is predicting but uh, what your actual value is in that case your error will be high so when you are want to give more penalty to those errors whether i have i am able to capture those outliers or not so in that case your rmsc is going to put more uh, penalty to that right your uh, model will be tuned as per that but when you are applying mean absolute error so in this case uh, these are not putting that much attention to the outliers and these are like ma is more robust to outliers and does not penalize the error as extremely as ms okay, this point all right so let's quickly go to the next part we can't minimize ma 
yeah rishabh so uh, i get it your question is uh, me cannot be used as a loss function right because you are differentiating but when you are just evaluating like uh, after your model has been run gradient descent has already been uh, like that has already been run uh, that has converged and you got your parameters now by using that model you will predict on validation data right and validation data you will have your y prediction you will have your actual y's and based on on that data on y uh, like predicted data as well as like your actual data you can get the me right it's not like you are uh, going to run gradient descent on that okay so prasant is saying whatever evaluation metric be uh will be used complete remove removal is re re prerequisite for all uh removal of outlier right so uh no that is what uh i i told you yesterday also so removal of outlier is not like that once you find like you by graph itself let's say you have plotted one scatter plot and in that you saw okay these are the points which i see that might be kind of uh outliers that might be an outlier you are not still not sure that these are outliers this might be the real cases also right so might be like uh, multiple person they are like wh wherever you are sampling your data getting your data in that case might be these are these all are your real use cases so in that case you don't want to remove your outliers might be like you need to relook at the data and relook like how your data was collected and that those things you need to uh, then again evaluate that okay exactly these are outliers or not right so removing outliers actually uh, it depends on the businesses right when you are like running in like when you are working in some company and they are like uh, you need to have uh, you need to look into that whether those are outliers or not uh, but yeah it's advisable that if you find that okay these outliers you don't need for the model this is not the actual instances so in that case you will remove that outlier definitely but yeah, still yeah it's very uh, like you need to check what all uh out whether like that outlier is actually removable or you need to keep it okay. yes so this is what uh ma is uh, where instead of squaring we are taking this absolute values right uh now yeah so now in this case uh it's just a uh, mean of it mean absolute percentage error so in this case uh the formula is this one where it is like 100% what it means like 100% just I'll, I'll give you an example let's say uh, n equals to 1 i'll just take one example so uh, your y i is let's say uh, one if you have one right so y is let's say actual value is 100 and what you predicted is 80 right so what you are going to do is like 100% divided by 1 summation that will be 1 itself so it's kind of 100 minus 80 right divided by 100 so 100% multiplied by 20 by 100, right so this is kind of like uh, you are getting 20% kind of right you are 0.2 multiplication you are getting 20% in this case so this is what it is as kind of 20% this ma your map is 20% in this case okay so yeah so this is what it is in this case if you have multiple then you will do the summation and these things will change right and mostly uh, this is being used to prediction of accuracy of a forecasting model in statistics like for example in trend estimation so when you will be uh, when you are working on regression but uh, that is not your uh, like that is time dependent regression so that is what time series is right so if you uh, like one one way is like you don't look at the time and then just look at marketing data kind of what i give an example like uh, uh, a tv advertisement how much you are investing in that uh, radio investment radio uh, on radio advertisement how are you how much you are investing just by looking that you can predict your sales one another method is you can look at the time series right your time factor how is that playing out right it might happen that during your uh during it depends on let's say just i will give you an example like summer collection uh apples those are being sold more during april to may to june let's say so there will be a uh, for sales you cannot just rely on your marketing thing you need to look at the time also so in that case, uh, in that case, if you want to uh, like do, if you want to have an evaluation metric, so in that case, this mean absolute percentage error that is being used. Okay. Okay. Now let's come to the next. That is R squared. So R squared is nothing uh, but just if there is another name to it. That is coefficient of determination. 
all right and uh, this is kind of uh, you need to like in uh, in other uh, all other metrics you will just try to check okay whether my current model has less error or not in terms of your other models right you cannot just say that okay this is my msc or map and uh, just sit around right you have to compare it with something so this is what r square is doing it is comparing your model with a baseline model all right and what is the baseline model it's just the baseline model is a constant baseline model it's uh, chosen by taking the mean of the data and drawing the line at the mean all right so just i'll give you an example let's say you have this data right you have this data this is just x and y kind of uh, and then what you will do you will take the mean of x right and in that case what you will do you will just uh, pass a line through that right right it it will just pass on with uh, through that line and in that case let's say this is the mean and uh, if you want to uh, like right if we just write a line around it so it will be kind of like this right yeah yeah so in this case uh, this is the line which is passing through uh, this particular point it might be like if you have multiple variables x1 x2 x3 so in that case all those mean points it will try to fit a line around that right it will try to fit a line and that is your baseline model right so it, what it will do it will just take the mean of all your x values and based on that it will create one uh, it will create a model basis that like those that best fit line will pass through that and that is considered as a baseline model all right and once you have baseline model mean squared error uh, and the model which you have created for that also it will uh, get the mean squared error and then it will just do the one minus of that particular thing the, the value which will you will get uh, it will be r square okay now uh, so in this case uh, like it is kind of scaled so these points are there which you should look into so these are scale free score that implies it does not matter whether the values are too large or too small too small so it's kind of too large and too small what i mean by that is like msc values whether that is too large or too small anyway it is going to have a scale free score right so r square will, will always be less than uh, or equal to 1 yeah so r square uh, it's obvious from this part, uh, particular formula itself, it is doing one minus. So in this case, this ratio cannot be negative. So it will not be uh, more than one, right? So maximum value you can get is one. But here, one thing is, okay, I'm getting one question. What is the good value of R squares? It depends. It depends. Most In most of the cases, uh, like 0 0.6 above or 0 0.7 above, you can say it's a good value of R square. Right, uh, but it actually depends on the problem statement and your past, uh, like models, how that was performing. Right, but it mostly like uh, if your R square is more than zero point seven, higher the better. But if it is more than zero point seven, you can say you have a uh, better model in this case. All right, so there is one, but there is one problem with R square. So uh, when you will be getting, uh, let's say r square can can't be negative no r square can be negative i'll come to that right i'll come to that uh, most in most of the cases your r square uh, should be r square should be 0 to 1 right that is the like you in most of the research papers in, in on internet you will find like it is it is between 0 to 1 but in some cases it might go negative also so i'll i'll give you that example Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, where was I? Yeah, so R square has some fundamental issues. So what that issue is, when you are, uh, let's say when you are uh, running a multiple regression, right, uh, which you will be doing in most of the cases. So let's say you have uh, n number of variables. So what happens with R square, when you add more variables to it, your R square will automatically go up. Right? So it's not like you will, uh, if you are, you are adding new variables, it does not mean your model is performing better or now this model has become better, right? It might be like uh, using 10 variables or the earlier you had 10 variables, you added two more, right? So in that case, you have added noise and now your model is not performing well. So in that case, but R square will increase. So it will give you a pseudo, pseudo uh, feel that, okay, my, this model is better if you are just looking at R square. Right. And why that that happens? So I'll just give you uh, like 
brief about it like why uh, with increase in variables your r square increases right so in that case like your msc is nothing but 1 by n y minus y predicted whole square right summation so if you write y predicted so let's say you have first let's take one case where we have one variable so it will be beta naught plus beta 1 x1 right and another case will be where we have two variables let's say these two models are there x1 plus beta 2 x2 right so when you are doing this 1 minus y hat right so model 1 this is model 1 this is model 2 Okay, so for model one, what will happen? Uh, this equation, this error equation, right? MSC equation. What it will become? Y minus beta naught plus beta one x one, right? And whole square of this, this is model one. This is for model two, it will be Y minus beta naught plus beta one x one plus beta two x two. Right, whole square divided by n divided by n divided by n. Uh, it can be negative when our model is performing worse than mean of actual way exactly right uh, so when your baseline if it is performing worse than baseline model itself then obviously it will go negative right uh, that that i'll explain in properties of r square all right so yeah so when you will see here uh, this value, this M1 will, will always be smaller than M2, right? Like M2, yeah, it will be greater than M2. M1 will always be greater than M2. Why? Uh, can someone answer me this? Uh, why M1 will be M1, this M1 MSE, this squared error, mean squared error for model 1, will always be greater than your model 2 MSC. Like, can someone figure out like how, why this will happen? Just think on it. Exactly right. Exactly right. So in the uh, second, we are subtracting more from y. And as this is like squared value, so this is always going to be positive, right? So in this case, your m1 will always be greater than m2, right? So now you're with the addition of new variables, that means your mean squared error is decreasing, right? So your, when your mean squared error is decreasing, so this ratio also becomes less and less right it it actually drops so when you are when it is dropping so one minus if something is dropping so this r square will increase so that for that that, that is the issue like when you are adding new variables your msc going to decrease and based on that your r square will increase all right so that is why we have another uh, which is adjusted r square so uh, like it's nothing but it's a just a simple change in formula so you can just look into it uh, where we are taking number of observations number of independent variables and r square these using all these factors this uh, at, like this r square is here so using all these factor factor we are just uh, like penalizing it and not uh, not exactly saying that okay when your new variables has been added it's not like your model gonna improve uh, I'll look at the adjusted R square and then decide whether my model one with less number of variable was better or with new variable added model, whether that is better or not, right? So in that case, you will look at adjusted R square. Few things to note here, like adjusted R square will always be lower than R square. Mean of Y. So how baseline uh, MSC is calculated for multivariable case. Okay, so multivariable case, yeah, yeah. So in that case, uh, Samantha, yeah, exactly. So in this case, if you have multivariable and you want to uh, get from baseline MSC, so for each variable, each each explanatory variable, you will have mean values, right? For let's say x1, x2, x3, and everything. So you have mean values. Now using that mean value, you will try to get the best fit line. Just those using those mean values, right? That will connect all those uh, points. 
and that will be your best fit line in that in that case and then using that best fit line it will try to get the error right msc values okay so yeah so few properties uh, like uh, most in most of the cases you have r square ranging between 0 to 1 but uh, it might go like r square might uh, range from minus infinity to 1 like uh, like if it is not being like it might be like your if your model is performing worse than your baseline model then obviously like uh, your model your r square value will be negative like it's so bad that if you are saying it is negative then definitely you should work on like whether there are outliers just remove them in that case because because of those your best fit line is like performing worse than your base base model right a uh, baseline model and and then again uh, you have to really look into why this is happening right so those things you need to cover like then you need to see that for some cases uh, it might happen that your trend is going down it should have the negative values but instead of that you are predicting the positive ones so those things might be there like uh, you need to really look into that when you are getting negative values okay uh, when r square is zero means there is no correlation between dependent and independent variable definitely yeah. like if it is zero that means like it's kind of your baseline model is equal uh, baseline model equals your current model and that means like there is no actual correlation between dependent and independent variables now uh, again like opposite to that like if your r square is one that means like it's a perfect uh, pattern you are getting from your independent variables right so your uh, dependent variable can be explained and uh, like it, it, it will be explained using this these uh, dependent variable uh, itself like independent variable itself your explanatory variable so your explanatory variables are enough to predict your dependent variable if you get your r square as one and that is like very rare sight which you will see right now fourth thing is like how you understand what r square is right so r square of 0 0.2 uh, means like 20 percent of variance in y is predictable from x and if it is like again if it's 0.4 means like 40 percent variance is pre predictable okay so what do you mean by like 20 percent uh, variance in y is predictable right so it's kind of like up to what range like let's say if uh, it's kind of understanding right uh like 20 percent of your uh variance it means let's say you have a data right data like this and now you have a best fit line right so in this case you are able to capture 20 percent of the information right you are like you are able to predict for 20 percent of the cases you can just think of analogy like like that like in you in 20 percent of the cases you are predicting it right right when it is like 40 percent then for the 40 percent of the cases you are predicting it right right when it goes to 70 percent 80 percent again higher for like let's say it is one then it means like for 100 percent of the cases you are able to uh, predict using this current model right that is what this actually means all right uh, so one thing is left that is vif right so let's go back to that and uh, with that this lecture will end and then vikas will take up So where we have multicollinearity, yes, here. Yeah. So now you know what R square is, right? This is nothing, and this is not adjusted R square. This is the R square, right? So what you what happens when you are like uh, calculating variation inflation factor? So what actually this is uh, this is doing uh, is like it is trying to find that all your explanatory variables whether they are correlated with each other or not. Right. So what it, it is going to do, it will take, let's say uh, you have X1, X2, X3 and number of variables. Right. So what it will do, it will try to like, it will keep X1 as these are your explanatory variables. Right. Now we cover calculating VIF. What happens? Your X1 will be considered as your dependent variable. And one by one, it will try to predict using X2, X3. Right. Similarly for using X4. And this is that it will, what it will do, it will try to look uh, what is its R square, right? What is its R square? And this is that it will give you a VIF value for this particular variable X1. For X1, if it lies greater, if it is greater than five. So in that case, uh, 
it will tell you that okay this x1 is correlated with any with some other variable that that information you will get okay well, let's say you have seen for x1 for iteration one this i this i was explaining uh, yesterday also let's say you ran your vif function right and you saw that your x1 is 5 this is 7 this is 8 or you have x4 also so in that case it is 1 now what do you mean by this and how do you infer this so in this case it means that your x1 has a value of 5 which will we will consider as, as on a higher side it means that some of the variable or any one of the variable right at least one of the variable is correlated with this x1 and similar thing is happening with x2 also and similar thing is happening with x3 also so now you have to do you have to go back again to the board and uh, look for like what you can do and uh, like pre-processing you have to either you can remove these or you can run pca principal component analysis you can do so these kind of things you need to do either uh, you can do the add addition of that what is the maximum value of vif it's not it's not nothing like that like uh, uh, it starts from one right starts from one but it can go as high. i have seen 1300 also right 1300 1400 vif right so there is no kind of you can say it can be infinite yeah so in this case if your ri becomes one uh, then it becomes infinity right yeah so i think uh, if most of the things everything i have covered in this particular lecture if you guys have any question you can put them now okay how do you decide uh, which feature to element eliminate using vif okay so uh, we are going to start with the uh, most correlated one uh, values which are like uh, features which has the higher highest vif from there you will start and then you will look for other uh, uh, kind of uh, features which is near to this let's say you find one uh, i'll give you an example here so let's go to the end here and then i'll give So let's say x1, x2, x3, these four variables are there. You saw a VIF value of uh, 15, 10, 8, and 2, right? So what you are going to do is once you see this VIF, you start working right from the top ones. So it means why I am starting with top ones? Because I know this is the variable, uh, this x1 has most correlated other variables right this has the very this variable is correlated with most of other variables because it has the highest vif right so in that case what i'll do i'll try to look i'll try to drop this x1 first thing is like you need to understand what this variable and uh, what all variables uh, might be there which will be correlated to this for that you will uh, plot your uh, like correlation matrix right your correlation matrix that you will plot like this will be x1 x2 x3 x4 and x1 x2 x3 and x4 this there will be one correlation to it right some correlation values you will be seeing here so based on that now you will decide okay uh my x1 is highly correlated with x4 let's say right so now you are going to do uh some pre-processing it might be like you are just adding them or you are dropping one of them if let's say if x1 and x4 is like correlated with 0.98 so it makes sense to just keep one right uh then in some cases and that really depends on it depends on your experience also whether you can do some or not but it's, it should not be like uh without thinking anything you are creating feature like just terming it out and creating another feature so when you are doing some or creating any new feature there has to be some logic behind it but uh yeah like uh these are all methods which you can apply you can either sum it up you can remove one of them uh, by looking at this correlation matrix and then again going back to running like if you are decided to drop one of those let's say you drop x1 because uh you have all, you are already seeing zero x4 is explaining most of things so in that case you will drop it and then again you will run with these only variables to the vif and you might be seeing that okay uh now your uh vif has come in a let's say in a respectable range four three and two kind of then you are good to go these are these mostly these are not correlated to each other
Okay, what can we do if our dependent variable is also highly correlated variable having? Oh, our dependent variable will never go into this, right? Dependent variable is different. This we are talking about independent variables. Dependent variables should be should highly correlated with all your uh, independent variables. Right? It's a, it's a like it's kind of like you have hit the you have now got the variables you have hit the jackpot if you are saying high VIA values or high highly correlated with dependent or uh, independent variables. Okay. So any any other question? Uh, yeah. Hello, hello. Uh, Rajat, this side. Yes, Rajat. Tell me. Uh, so like I am basically asking like if I find a variable and that variable is having having a high VIA value. Mm -hmm. And that variable is also like having a high dip, uh, correlation with like my variable, like a dependent variable. Okay. In that case, like we have to drop that uh, thing or what should we do in that case? So in that case, if you are saying, let's say, uh, then what will happen? So what does this mean? Let's say you are saying that X1 is highly correlated with your Y, right? But X4, when you look at X4 with Y, so let's say this is the correlation of 0 .0, 0 0.95 with Y. X1 is correlated. Uh, the correlation value is uh, 0 0.95. With X4 to Y, you see 0 0.8, right? So in this case, you, are, you can decide to drop X4, right? So that is how it works. Like if you are saying, th the most important thing is it's your, uh, if, you're, if it is like highly correlated with your Y, then obviously you have to keep that in your model, right? But if you are saying that with X1, what all uh, correlated val uh, variables are there and basis that you can decide whether I should keep X4 or whether I should drop X4 or X1. So these are all things you will see in the implementation part. So these all things will, uh, this will be covered. Like when you will take, when you will see that how we decide based on VIF and all, but this is like overview of it. This is how we work on it. Does this answer your question, Rajat? Okay, cool. All right. So I think uh, we have covered most everything here in this particular lecture. So I'll uh, request Vikash to take over it. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Vikas Shavasto. So I hope uh, <coughs> you, uh, yeah, you guys are now familiar with the concept of linear regression and in fact, multiple linear regression as well. So, you know, uh, so whenever we have a single variable and we're trying to uh, model the output variable with a single variable, so we'll call that a univariate linear regression as in a single variable is only used to uh, model the dependent variable. But in case, let's say when we have multiple variables, so that is what we'll call as multivariate or linear regression, or you can simply say that to be as multiple linear regression. Right. So this is what uh, we have. Uh, uh, you uh, you have learned up till now, right? So you got to know a lot of, about the inner workings of the uh, linear regression. So one important thing is that linear. Uh, so problems uh, of linear regression, they are they are they can be solved using analytical methods as well. So here in the case of, uh, so there are two approaches essentially when you're trying to solve a linear regression problem, okay? So there's one an analytical approach, the other is machine learning approach. So in machine learning approach, essentially what uh, we want to do, we want to estimate the parameters or the regression coefficients, that is your betas, uh, using the gradient descent, right? So that's a, numerical approach that's an iterative approach and whenever we see that yeah our parameters are not getting updated by let's say uh, uh, are not getting updated uh, uh, based on a fixed threshold or epsilon right so you'll say that yeah our model has been trained and these are our uh, model coefficients or regression coefficients uh, on this base on this particular data right and then there is another approach which is your statistical approach or should i call that analytical that means your linear regression problem is uh, solvable analytically. So if, I'm not sure if you have uh, remember, if you have heard of normal equation, because that's the equation most of the time you would have used when you are solving less a linear uh, equation in three variables or linear equation in two variables. So you're using some matrix multiplication. 
and then you are able to come up with the uh, appropriate coefficient. So we'll discuss the statistical approach uh, on Saturday. Uh, as of now, we are only going to cover the machine learning formulation, which you already know, that is through the gradient descent algorithm, right? So. Uh, Right, so you know about the statistical approach, that's fine, right? So, so there's also, we need to do some statistical test or as in we need to analyze the statistical results uh, for the regression coefficients, right? So let's say for a particular variable, your coefficient comes out to be, let's say nine, right? But now you need to do some uh, test to uh, determine whether that particular uh, regression coefficient value is statistically significant or not. Right, so we'll be doing a, uh, a bit of exploration towards that front on Saturday. Okay, so it will be a good thing for you guys to just recap because mostly there will be using the statistical concept that we have learned like p-value, etc. Right, so, uh, okay. So there are a few questions I want you guys to tell me before I show you the implementation of linear regression in Python. It's pretty straightforward, right? It uh, does not require a lot of brain. Right, you just need to do some standard. Uh, you need just need to follow some standard procedures, and you need to do just fit and predict. So yeah, uh, first train the model using fit and using predict. What you'll need to do, uh, what you're going to do, you're going to validate your model on the validation data, right? Or validate as in evaluate your model, right? So uh, I have shared the Padlet link over the chat, right? So. Uh, so my question is, firstly, can you tell me, so what do you think when I say the term model, right? So when I say a machine learning model, uh, what comes to your mind? And what are the things that can affect that? I'll say that, yeah, this model is different from this model, right? So can you guys please answer on the Padlet? So what do you understand by the term model? Guys, can you please start uh, answering this question on the Padlet? Right, so I've shared the link uh, over the chat. Right, cannot see the add button. Okay, okay, just uh, hang on. Maybe there's some... Uh, no, I think you should be able to do that, no? Uh, we are not able to edit for typing okay just hang on just give me a second maybe i'll just create a new one uh, right so Okay, so I, I'll share this. So, yeah, so you can start. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, so I am able to do that. Okay, so what do you mean by, what do you understand by the term model, right? So don't, uh, right? So what do you understand by the term model? Okay, so, and I'm going to ask a lot of specific questions. So of course, this is, uh, something which is pretty generic, but I'm going to ask you very specific questions as well. Okay, so it's a tool which will help us to predict something. Okay, uh, just hang on. I'm not able to see which. So, uh, yeah. All right, so. Okay, so essentially a model is nothing but a function, which as Prashant is saying, so it takes in some input variables and it makes some prediction, right? So that is what a model is. And in fact, when you talk about machine learning model, so that means uh, that model uses some particular machine learning algorithm, which is essentially a function, right? So, it, it, uh, so different machine learning algorithms will have different functional forms and they will take input and the input variables 
and uh, they will uh, spit out the output right so that's what the model is okay now i'm i'm going to ask you new questions uh, essentially in context of model only so let's say you have a linear regression model okay model right so now in the let's say there is a model uh, let's say for linear regression where your y hat uh, is essentially beta not plus let's say beta 1x plus uh, maybe x1 beta 2x2 etc maybe let's say we have three variables here right x1 x2 x3 so y hat is the predicted value uh, and uh, that is what we are trying to do right so we uh, we want to uh, have some inputs uh, pass those inputs through a function and that will uh, give us the output value and this is what that function is right so if i were to say uh, so if i were to ask you what a model is so let's say your training data set is x comma y so x is your independent variables right and y is your dependent variable right and uh, <clears throat> okay so in uh, terms of this how can you uh, specifically uh, uh, tell me what a model is right so let's not even bother about this particular bit okay uh, let's not even bother about this one okay so now let's say you just have just just have this particular equation right so what what do you mean by a model right here right so can you please tell me right so uh maybe i'll just clear the posts and then you can start answering so okay so maybe you can uh, update your answer or in fact i'll just uh, clear all the posts and you can answer earlier right so you can start answering again right so in this particular context so what your model would be right so you said that it is a function which uh, takes some inputs but if you were to very specifically uh, determine the model so what would you uh, tell right so so of course you have already uh, told me earlier right that a model is essentially a function but i right so smooth is pretty correct here right so it's a function of beta not beta 1 beta 2 beta 3 right so so let's say if this uh, if this functional form or that this function is let's say we are not going to bother about the functional form okay as in it is it is going to be something plus beta 1 x something like this right so this is the form which is a linear regression right because there are terms and you are just adding those terms right so let's assume we have this fixed functional form in which uh, will add so every term will essentially be the coefficient multiplied by that variable right and beta not is essentially the variable is a uh, one right so x0 so here you can have x0 which is essentially one right so so i can specify my model to be precisely as just the set of these values beta not beta 1 beta 2 beta 3 right so so this is how i am going to specify my model so let's say if i know all these values if i know all these four values right so i can plug those values in let's say this particular form so maybe let's say beta not is 1 let's say 1 uh, plus let's say 2x plus 3 3x2 plus 4x3 right so this is one essentially one uh, model right or one linear regression equation right so this is so your model will essentially be determined by these coefficients or the model parameters right so these are what we call as model parameters right and once you know the parameters you know you can define your model right because if you have assumed your functional form that is going to be linear right of course different complex machine learning algorithm they can have different functional form they could they will not be very simple as simply summation of or addition of these terms right but once you know the functional form so your model can be specified by these parameters and the goal of any machine learning task uh, is to learn these parameters based on your data right so now uh, i have another question for you this is a simple yes or no answer so i'll just going to clear the post here okay so now let's see uh, 
my so i have one pair of uh, let's say training data so x1 comma y1 and x2 comma y2 right so x x1 is essentially the set of all independent variables and y1 is the dependent variable for let's say some data set which is and this this could be some data set i am call this as d1 right so x1 comma y1 where x1 is essentially the set of all independent variables and y1 is the corresponding dependent variable and then let's say i have another data set d2 so here also i have a, uh, a and, and the set of independent variables which is x2 and then the corresponding dependent variable y2 right so now let's say if d1 and d2 they are different as in let's say the size is different or the number of independent variables are different right so do you think the model parameters will change right so let's say if d1 and d2 are different do you think uh, model parameters will change as in beta not beta 1 beta 2 beta 3 right so does everyone think so that if i change my input data set or my training data set right so my training data set will be the pair of x comma y because here we are doing supervised learning right so yes so, so they will change so everyone concurs with this particular point that yes if i change the data set right even though i have kept the same functional form if i change the data set my model is going to change because uh, for different uh, data sets right so i am going to get different set of uh, values for these model parameters right and because these parameters are what that define the model right so if i take some different data sets so i am bound to get some different values of beta not beta 1 beta 2 beta 3 and and i'll have a different model right so a model is essentially a combination so a model is essentially not only the machine learning algorithm so in this case this is a linear regression uh, algorithm a model is essentially uh, is defined by or is affected by the choice of the algorithm plus the choice of the data set right so uh, if you change the data set or um, if you uh, basically employ any such techniques which causes the model parameters to change that means you are getting a different model right so if so let's say if the combination of beta naught and beta 3 so is something like 0 to 1.51 right so this could be model m1 and let's say if i have something like 0 0.51 to 3 right so this is a different model right even though the functional form is same as in it's a linear regression algorithm but the algorithm only will not determine your model right your input data set your training data set it will it will determine what's your model going to be because that will uh, affect the values of the parameters right and as you know the goal of any machine learning algorithm is to learn all these per model parameters based on the training data set and you know in training data set you have x comma y right so you learn the mappings so that uh, you are able to come up with very reasonable estimates of the model parameters and then once you have uh, gotten those parameters using your training data set then uh, you can use that uh, model which is for which the, now the parameters are fixed right because that's the meaning of training so now once the parameters are fixed so let's say this is a fixed model so you can plug in these values here in, in this particular equation and now for any test input that is x1 x2 and x3 for any test input you can plug in uh, their values and you'll be getting a predicted value right so that is how the things are going to be right so i'll just give you a tabular uh, demonstration or representation of uh, that very fact which i just told so let's say this is our data set right so i have one variable two variable and then just assume let's say i have five variables so let's call them x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 and then this is your of course y which is your dependent variable right and of course uh, this is uh, one observation this is first observation second observation and then there could be let's say thousand such observation it could be any n number of observations right and of course you can have n number of uh, variables or as well right so let's say they take some values let's say 0 0.2 1 1.1 things like this right so you can of course fill all these boxes right so now this is your actual y right this y is already given to you because let's say if you were to predict the uh, 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 price of a house right so if you were to predict what is uh, what is the 
sale price for a house is going to be right so because a lot of properties or houses have been sold in history right in past so you know their uh, selling prices right so you know the actual values and in future uh, your task is to let's say if you give me some characteristic about certain houses as in the number of bedrooms or uh, the locality the neighborhood a lot of different factors could be there right so if you give me those information i can uh, pass that all, pass all those information let's say for a single house into the model and that model will give me the predicted value of a sale price right so this is the actual and of course and then by building the model let's say th that model is what you're calling as m right so let's say this is y hat so by plugging the test input in your model right so by plugging the test input in your model right so you can calculate these values so let's say the selling price for a house was maybe let's say 10 to the power 6 dollars and your value came out to be something like let's say 5.8 into 10 to the power 5 something like this all right so the difference between the two values this is the actual value sorry all right so this is the actual value right and this is the predicted value right and as as a smart uh, data scientist our goal would be to minimize the errors uh, between the actual and the predicted values across all observations right so you have to uh, come up with certain metrics which summarizes this deviation or the difference between your predicted and uh, actual values in such a way that you get a very good idea that your model is uh, how your model is performing right so as Alok walked walk you through different uh, regression metrics, right? So they all sort of summarize this particular information, right? So what's the difference between your predicted value and the actual value, right? And the smaller the differences, the difference across all the observations, right? That means your model is doing really well. It's pretty close to your actual value. And then you can say that, yeah, I can actually rely on my model for making any such prediction. So, okay, come on and give me any details of the houses. Uh, I'll uh, pass all those relevant details into my model and then my model is going to give me a very reasonable prediction, right? Of course, uh, your model is only a model, right? It is, so it's not, uh, it does not capture the entire reality of things, right? It is only a model, right? So that means it can only do uh, some certain set of tasks, right? It is uh, only capable limited it is this the capability of a model is limited by our imagination only right so you need to have uh, very small differences for a really good uh, ma machine learning model right and you can make very reasonable predictions and you'll be confident about making predictions for uh, those use cases right so of course uh, regress a lot of different uh, problems in uh, world in different businesses a lot of problems can be formulated in terms of regression and then you can build a model right and uh, you can uh, get the predictions and see how how far off the predictions are from the actual values and based on that uh, you'll see right so uh, when when i told you that the goal of any machine learning model is to learn these parameters beta not beta one beta two beta three right uh, of course if you have more variables of course you will have uh, greater number of coefficients but let's imagine this is your trained data set right as in what you are doing you're passing into the model this combination x comma y x means your x1 till x5 and then y is your dependent variable right so you're passing that into the model and the model is sort of learning is, is so it's making predictions and uh, just comparing from the actual values and say saying that yeah there there is some let's say greater difference so it will try to optimize in that way and that is how gradient descent is going to work right because that's a part of training now once you have trained the model as in you have fixed the betas right so now you will have a validation data or we can call that a test data and on that uh, test data you're going to make some predictions right because no observations from your test data will be part of the training right so you'll have a reserved test data and you want to see how your model is performing on that unseen data right so once you train the model you get you train or learn the parameters of the model that is in, in the case of linear regression those are betas and once you have learned those betas 
so you're going to uh, take a test inputs and then you're going to make predictions for those test inputs right and then of course in most uh, in cases uh, for test data as well or validation data will have the actual values as well right and there we can see that how far my more uh, how far uh, how far uh, of the predictions are from the actual values right because these observations were never part of the training right and the model has never seen seen those observations right so this is the basic uh, crux of things as in what machine learning is uh, all about right and how linear regression essentially works right so you're familiar with all those things uh, at this point of time so let's do a simple walkthrough of uh, uh, so uh, let's do a simple implementation of uh, multiple linear regression right so i have a very small data set but uh, this is uh, pretty reasonable to just tell you how you can uh, build a machine learning model right in python right so there are few things which will be new to you in this case so firstly we will uh, import these libraries right so numpy pandas and from numpy will be importing math i will come to know what is the use of math that will be going to do then there is this library which is sk learn which is short uh, short for uh, scikit learn and this is in fact the most popular library for machine learning right especially when you talk about traditional machine learning as in uh, uh, you, you don't if you don't if you're talking about deep learning which in, is essentially very complex algorithms right so sk learn is not for that of course you have other frameworks such as pytorch tensorflow keras etc but uh, for all the models that we are going to learn in this module we'll be able to get them in the sk learn library itself right so bit linear regression logistic regression and then uh, if you have uh, support vector machines neural networks uh, basic decision tree so all those uh, models are available in sk learn but not only the models are available a lot of mod a lot of uh, pre processing uh, support is there uh, how can you do model selection so there are a lot of different aspects uh, to this which will learn uh, in this particular implementation part okay so as of now you don't have to worry and then of course there is this metrics part uh, from where you can import the required uh, evaluation metrics right so i'll come back to these things but for now let's uh, understand what's the uh, problem we are going to solve and that will help us uh, 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 implement uh, linear regression for that particular problem and see how that that's done in python right so i have imported the data set and let me see if it's available right so my data set is pretty small it has only 50 observations right of course in real life you'll have very you can have large larger data sets you can have smaller data sets right but the techniques will more or less be the same right so here i have a data set which is related to startups and in, this is related to in fact 50 startups we do not know the name of the startups at this point of time and that's of course let's say not required but we are given some important information about these startups right so what we want to do right so for these startups we are given the r and d spend right so how much spend uh, how much money are they spending on research and development right and then uh, how much uh, um, money they are spending on administration how much money they are spending on marketing and then in which state uh, is that particular startup based out of right and then we have a last variable which is profit right so for each startup uh, we are given the profit right so the whole idea of this problem is to let's say if i give you a basic information about a particular startup that is the r and d spend administration spend marketing spend and the state so can you build a model to predict the profit that startup will make so this is our task right so here you can see that or you can or, or you've already imagined that this profit is your dependent variable right so this is what we are going to model right so my input variables will be let's say r and d spend administration marketing spend and state right of course this is a categorical variable will uh, learn to deal with these variables and just a while but you're given these four inputs and on the basis of this you need to predict what's the profit going to be right so that's our task and because profit can take a continuous spectrum of values so that's why this is a regression problem right so my data set has 50 rows and five columns right so so let's now do some interesting uh, visualization 
So I'm going to create a scatter plot of uh, profit with marketing spend, right? So on the Y axis, I have profit. So let me just rerun this again, right? So on the Y axis, I have profit and on the X axis, I have marketing spend. Okay. So uh, let me just clear the padlet. Okay. So by looking at this scatter plot, uh, do you think uh, profit and marketing spend are linearly relate, related or are they correlated in any way? Can you tell me uh, in the padlet, right? So you can write yes, if you agree, you can write no, if you don't, okay? So here is the uh, scatter plot, right? So this is the profit and this is the marketing spend, right? So the question is, is profit correlated with marketing spend, right? And if it's, it's correlated, can you tell me um, how is it correlated? Is it negatively correlated, positively correlated? Right, so a lot of people are saying uh, yes. Right, so this is uh, correlated uh, with marketing spend uh, in a positive way. Why so? Right, this is of course not a perfect correlation, but here, as you can see, so for very uh, low values of marketing spend, the profit is low. Right, but as we uh, increase the marketing spend, you can see the profit is also increasing. Right, so as you can see, for the highest value of marketing spend, we have the highest profit. But of course, there can be some points here and there. Just look at this particular point. Right, so for this, the marketing spend is somewhere here, but the profit is quite high. Right, and if you talk about these particular points, so for them, the marketing spend is more or less the same, but the profit is larger for this particular point, right? So, of course, there's no perfect correlation here, but uh, it's, uh, uh, we can say that, yeah, it's uh, definitely positively correlated, right? So, you can sense some pattern here, right? So, of course, scatter plot is a very good way to qualitatively say how the two variables are related, right? You have learned about this. Now, let's see how the profit is related with R&D spend, okay? So, now, uh, can you tell me, so maybe I'll just uh, clear the padlet again and you can uh, answer it. Right, so can you tell me, is profit correlated with R&D spend? And if it's uh, uh, positive or negative? Right, so strong positive correlation. Okay, that's great. Okay, so it's a very strong correlation. As you can see, you can, uh, fit a line here and it would be all right right so maybe i can use some annotation right so uh, so you can have a line like this right and uh, it, this seems like a very good uh, so profit is very good uh, or very well correlated with r d spend and that makes sense right so the more you spend on r d right so the better the company is going the startup is going to be and that's why uh, that will help drive the profits of uh, profit of the business as well Right. Also, if you spend more enough on marketing, so uh, your profits will also increase, right? Because you are able to now reach to the wider audiences. In some cases, because of the nature of startups, right? So some startups can be B two C, B two B, right? So they're different, and of course the sectors can be different, right? So uh, you can see, uh, just like uh, in this particular scatter plot, right? So if you compare this point and this point, right? So marketing spend is more or less the same the profit is larger, right? So it, it can also depend upon other factors, right? So it could be the nature of startups in which domain it is operating, etc. Right, so, <clears throat> right. So now moving ahead, uh, we have another variable which is administration. So now let's see what's, uh, how the scatter plot looks like. So here you have profit again, and then you have administration, right? So now, uh, I'll just clear the padlet again and then ask you the same question. Do you think uh, uh, profit is correlated with administration here? So do you think based on these 50 data points, do you think profit is correlated with administration? Okay, so uncorrelated, not at all. Okay, so, okay. so everyone seems to be, uh, seems to be having the same opinion, right? So as you can see, so there's hardly any correlation, right? So maybe let's say if, if you look at this particular value of administration spend, right? So here, this is around what? Uh, almost, let's say, 100K uh, dollars, right? So 
for the same values so you are getting a range of profit values right so profit is low but high as well but here also for the high administration spend right so you can see that the yeah, profit is high, also low also high right so there is no clear demarcation uh, between the values of administration and profit right so if the values of administration increases right and so if the value of administration increases i cannot say that profit will also increase or decrease right so there is no uh, well defined correlation here right so but in this case i can say that if i increase the value of r and d spent my profit is also going to increase right so we'll say that this is a positive correlation but here we cannot say the same about in this uh, particular for this particular pair of variables right so in this case we'll say that profit and administration uh, they are not related to each other right so uh, so i i'll just point out uh, i'll ask one of you guys to tell me why do you think this is the case so maybe uh, so so priyanshi can you please tell me uh, why do you think uh, there is no such correlation between profit and administration so do you have any um, uh, explanation for this so you can unmute yourself and answer hello uh, priyanshi uh, can you please unmute yourself and uh, tell me if if you think pro why profit and administration are not correlated uh, am i audible yes yes you are audible okay so as we can see in the plot uh, that there is uh, we cannot see that the dots are not in one direction it's like right. scattered all over that's why no so that's totally fine that is what we are getting but let's say if you were to qualitatively explain okay so if you were to come up with an english sentence that uh, that uh, could help us reason more into this right so why does why is administration spend not related to profit so what do you think should that be the case um um as we can see that the graph is not uh, in a particular direction that's what i can uh, come so, up with so uh, if you oh, okay let me ask someone else okay so maybe uh, uh, rishab uh, can you please unmute yourself so do you have any explanation for why administration spends are not related to profit at all so do you have any reasonable explanation for the same So, so yeah, because yeah, hello, yeah, I'm yeah. audible. Yeah. Yes, yes. So it's because all uh, the data points are all over scattered, right? So it is as like uh, the same. I will go with Priyanshi only, but I don't have at that particular word or sentence you are looking for. Okay, okay. So maybe okay, Sumanta, uh, you can try. Yeah. Hello, Vikas. Yeah. So right. I. i think we are getting a large amount of value for profit for a single value of administration for example uh, for 12 uh, uh, it's uh, 120000 for 120000 uh, cost of administration we are getting a range of profits right okay uh, that's why i think for a single uh, that means there is no particular mapping from x to y that's why uh, oh that's that's fine see my question is from the business perspective uh, side of things right so as a business let's say if i were to uh, make a prediction that uh, yeah this particular startup is going to make so so and so profit right so there has to be a logical explanation right so i can see that yeah the more money i spend on r and d the profit uh, is going to go up right but let's say if i keep spending on administration right so can i give it a yeah. try yes yes sanjita go ahead so i am just like thinking that uh, you know um, even if you are increasing the amount of you know cost for our administration it is not going to affect the sale or how the product is doing in the market in any way like that is not a direct correlation with the you know how the uh, the product is going to perform so right. we cannot find a relationship between them right so i think yeah you are uh, totally uh, correct right so so administration spend is sort of which is sort of internal right and they are sort of uh, 
so all these spends in administration are uh, on managing the workforces and a lot of other things right and they do not uh, they do not drive the profit because this is an internal uh, spend right and this is not the spend on let's say your research team or increasing your workforces but more or less administration where you're trying to uh, uh, allocate some money to manage your internal uh, uh, workings right so that's why the profit is not uh, well correlated with administration right so whenever you are observing any data right so you need to come up with a log logical explanation especially from the business side of things right so once you understand that yeah this totally makes sense right so if i am saying that i'm saying seeing a positive possibly correlate correlation between let's say a pair of variables so why would that be right so if i increase the r and d spend who guarantees that my profit is going to increase right so uh, you need to come up with very logical explanation for whatever observations you are making right so if you are getting any such graph so you can come up with a very logical explanation and uh, put up a hypothesis that yeah i think uh, in the administration most of the money is going in managing or developing the processes uh, for the internal workforce and that's why it's not contributing profit at all right so okay so that's it so now let's see what's the distribution of uh, uh, what's the uh, average profit across different states right so remember in our data set uh, we have a column called state in which there are three different uh, categories in fact three different values so one is the new york state the other is california and the third is florida okay so let's see the bar chart okay so as you can see the average profit for startups in california is this in florida it's pretty high and in new york this is more or less similar to what uh, is the average profit in florida right so uh, okay so a general question for you guys again so why do you think the average profit for startups uh, in california is less so uh, any reasonable explanation so maybe uh, i'll just clear the padlet and you guys can take a uh, can go at it right so any explanation do you think so why do you think california has a relatively lower average profit as compared to states like florida and new york so high living cost okay I, that totally makes sense okay high living cost uh okay so you can say that uh, okay let uh, let other people answer so there are a lot of large mncs okay large tech giants uh, already present okay okay so essentially california is an expensive state okay and uh, um, yeah it's an expensive state and uh, so uh, a lot of uh, capital is required to in fact uh, so there are a lot of uh, state taxes right so it's pretty expensive place and so the margin at which the startups are operating right the, which is what we call as profit right and that's uh, sort of pretty much uh, curbed down right because of uh, uh, because that place is quite expensive right so you know uh, the operating expenses could be pretty large as compared to uh, let's say new york or florida right so if the same startup let's say if it's uh, operating out of florida so its profit could be higher right because the operating expenses could be uh, lower because let's say the uh, rental prices are, i think are also pretty high uh, uh, in california as compared to florida right so okay so yeah so so essentially this is uh, what the bar chart tells us right so it, it compares the basic uh, the average profit uh, for these 50 startups right so in california i'm not sure how many okay so here we have right so if you do value counts so 17 startups are based out of new york 17 are based out of california and 16 are based out of florida so more or less equally distributed across these states okay so now we are going to do very interesting thing right so uh, okay so because we are going to implement a linear regression okay so let me just uh, right so given this data set right so how do we predict y hat 
so we'll have something like beta naught plus beta beta one and this x uh, okay i'll just write x one i'll oh, x one then beta two x two and then beta three x three and then of course i have uh, how many variables four variables okay so x one is let's say uh, your r and d spend your x2 is uh, administration spend x3 is your uh, marketing spend let's say and your x4 is your state okay so but now because state is a categorical variable it poses some problem for us right so the right so here of course because we are trying to predict a continuous value right because y hat is going to be a number right so all these have to be numbers right but x4 if you think about it it takes uh, values like new york california florida which cannot be passed here right because the model needs a number but we are let's say passing a string right so it would not make sense right so i cannot have an equation which will be like of the form uh, y hat equal to something like let's say 1.5 plus 2 x1 plus 3 uh, x2 plus 4 x3 a uh, plus 5 and here x4 is let's say four ty five times new york right so this does not make sense right this does not make sense so we need to do some treatment for the categorical variable which is state here right so uh, so there are some tricks which we can do to deal or uh, <clears throat> deal with let's say categorical variables as in uh, transform them in such a way that they can be passed to the model right so uh, any idea you guys have um, how do we do that so maybe i'll just yeah clear the padded again okay so you can update your answers so smoothie has written so for each different label create a separate feature with only two variables zero and one okay all right uh, this uh, this could be one thing okay so dummy variable right so so what uh, so uh, smoothie is saying so essentially let's say uh, so let's say this is this column state okay and let's say i, I i'm just taking five values let's say new york florida uh, california right and let's say this is again new york and this is cali for nia okay so now what smruti is suggesting that so we can have three variables depending upon the number of categories in the uh, variable right so there are three categories right new york florida and california right so i'll create three variables so let's say this is new york indicator something like this and let's say this is florida indicator which will uh, indicate whether uh, uh, a particular startup belongs to florida or not and then we'll have a california indicator something like this right so uh, so new york indicator we can take two values one or zero based upon uh, uh, depending upon whether that startup is based out of new york or not so here the startup is based out of new york so indicator is one but it's not based out of florida it, this value will be zero and this value will again be zero now for the second startup which is based out of florida new york indicator will be zero because it's not based of new york it is based out of florida so this will be one and this will be zero if it is based out of california these two will be zero and this will be one if it is based out of new york this will again be one and rest will be zero and similarly you can have these right so this is what we call as one hot encoding okay okay so uh all right so rohan is asking but why are we taking x2 and x4 since we know that they don't linearly affect the dependent variable right so uh, anyway so let's say if we know that they would not affect the dependent variable so let's say if i pass that into the model i'm expecting that the regression coefficient would be very minuscule for that particular feature right so so Sri Ram is saying that we are expanding the features here, which can be an issue if you have more categories, right? So, let's say if you have very large number of categories, so maybe if you have thousand rows and a 
and you have a state column which has let's say 50 states right so the uh, and if you want to incorporate that information if that's actually related to the profit so do you think guys uh, 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 all right so the thing is uh, if you have large number of categories so the number of dummy variables could increase right and of course you will need to come up with ways in which let's say you can reduce the number of features as in you only want to keep very relevant or important features right so uh, this is one way to deal uh, categorical variables okay so sheets is asking another question okay so so sanchita is saying why not put one two three okay so this is a very good question right and this is what uh, 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 sheets also asks. okay so i'll write a fresh equation for now the because now we have created the let's say uh, uh, so we have two sort of options right so we can either create these one hot encodings so and we can get the get rid of this particular column state right so what sort of variables will will we, will we have so we'll be having these variables right so r india spend administration marketing spend and then these variables right so new york florida and california so a total of seven variables right now there is uh, another alternative approach which San sanchita and uh, sheets are suggesting that uh, he, uh, we don't even need to create these three variables what we can do we can uh, fix the label one for new york two for uh, florida and three for california okay so now let's write the equation for the two cases okay so now uh, let me write the case one in which i have seven variables okay in which i have the one hot encoded variables so so essentially your y hat so assume that the, uh, okay okay no worries so y hat is equal to beta naught plus beta one so this could be let's say r and d spend okay so for a particular startup whatever the r and d spend could be so you can plug that number here plus beta two uh, let's say this is marketing spend beta 3 could be administration spend okay and uh, what else did we have okay so we had only th these three and then the state so out of which we got three more variables so i can write let's say beta 4 which could be let's say california indicator right so it indicates whether a particular startup uh, resides in california or not then we can have beta 5 which is your uh, florida indicator okay so this is based upon what we have learned uh, here right so so these are the variables which i am writing right and then i have let's say uh, new york indicator something like this right so now this can take a numerical value that's fine this can take a numerical value it's fine it can take a numerical value it's fine california indicator can take value zero or one so if it's one then it will have some contribution but let's say zero it will not have any contribution right because that term will is going to be zero similar is the case of florida uh, so it's a numerical value one or zero and if the startup is based out of new york so it will have some contribution because beta six can take some value right and new york indicator will be one in that case right so now so this is the case one now i'll use another right so now let's say i have case two so now in this case they are saying as in fact sanchita and sheets are suggesting that we, we can have one two three right so in this case how many variables are we going to have so beta naught plus beta one let's say this is r and d spend and then beta two is going to be marketing spend right beta 3 is going to be administration spend and then beta 4 uh, are suggesting that this is let's say state values okay because we cannot pass a, a string uh, to this in this particular equation right because uh, we need to have all of them as numbers right and here in state values uh, so, uh, some are suggesting that we can have values such as let's say one two or three something like this right so imagine let's say one corresponds to new york two corresponds to florida and three corresponds to california okay so if i plug in the value of uh, if a startup belongs to new york okay 
so the only difference between case one and case two would be in the uh, in this particular term so let's say if a particular startup belongs to new york so in your case one this particular term and this particular term is going to be zero but uh, this is going to be beta 6 into 1 right in this particular example so everything is going to be the same so this part is of course none, nonetheless the same right in this case two as well this part is nonetheless same right so this part, part is pretty much uh, is uh, exactly similar for both the cases but now we need to figure out how the state uh, is going to look like right so in the if a particular startup is based out of new york so in the case one these two terms these two terms they are going to be zero right and this term will be simply beta 6 into 1 because my new york indicator can take only two values one or zero so one if it is in new york okay now if you think about this so here i have extra term which is beta 4 into 1 okay something like this now imagine let's say if a particular startup is based out of california right so in case one what is going to do that this term will be beta 4 into 1 and this is going to be 0 this is again going to be 0 but in this case this is going to be beta 4 into 3 okay this is going to be beta 4 into 3 so now this actually induces some bias as in uh, the value of the predicted uh, profit right so that will be slightly exaggerated because uh, if uh, i'm saying that your particular startup be belongs to california or is based out of california so i'm going to multiply the coefficient with three with a factor of three right so and if, if you switch the labels let's say for new york you keep it three or you, for florida you keep it one so if a particular startup is based out of new york so you're giving that particular uh, uh, you're inducing that particular bias as in you're giving preference to uh, or you're trying to come up with an exaggerated value uh, of y hat or the predicted profit right so it's not e equ equivalent for all the three categories of the column straight right so that's why uh, it's we should not have one two and three there instead what we can do so uh, if we have a three categories in a categor categorical variable so we can create three in, in, uh, three variables which will be sort of indicators right so they can only take values ones or zeros but if you do uh, uh, if you come up with a construct in which the states can take values let's say one two three and let's say if you have more states so maybe one two three four five right so the larger the value because one two three does not have any meaning in order right so it's just for some uh, reference right but that is a but the model is going to treat that as a number right and that number has no meaning right the meaning is totally misplaced here right so it's it does not make sense that uh, we can have let's say these values for different states right so it is going to induce a lot of bias so i hope that's clear i guess so but suppose there is some tax issues uh okay so there could be some tax issues so that will be taken care uh, that will be taken care of by these coefficients which are beta 4 beta 5 beta 6 right so let's say and the taxes are pretty much high in california so the expected profit is low so this beta 4 will be slightly lower than let's say beta 5 and beta 6 this could be the case but when you fix these values 1 2 and 3 so there uh, you don't know which uh, state is going to have uh, how what is the tax is going to be like or there could be some different factors as well right so in the so what if you order them based on profits see of course you can come up with different constructs but the point is you are inducing a bias on your own why not why only one two and three why don't you go ahead with 10 20 and 30 right so why don't you go ahead into uh, go ahead with 10 20 and 30 in fact you can put any number for that matter right so i i for let's say new york i'll put 100 for uh, california i could put 200 and for florida i'll put 300 i can come up with any such label right but they are all inducing biases in our prediction because my predicted profit is going to be exaggerated 
if let's say the coefficients are positive or under uh, represented if the coefficients are negative so actually in this model our target is profit so if we drop a categorical variable then really that variable affect it can affect our model right so because here you right so here you saw in this bar chart let's say if a particular startup belongs uh, to california right so the average uh, profit is relatively lower right so so the coefficient for let's say this could be small because uh, if that value is small so your expected profit is going to be uh, sort of uh, uh, smaller only right and that would uh, conform uh, to the uh, available data as well okay so so try to understand this very important point that in this in the case of stayed values you cannot have let's say 1 2 3 or maybe something like 10 20 30 right so because uh, once you decide that yeah, you are going to pick 30 for let's say california so you are going to um, exaggerate the expected profit for that state right and that's and we do not want that but in this case uh, it's sort of uh, totally taken care of right so beta 4 beta 5 beta 6 or in fact all the regression coefficients will be decided uh, using gradient descent algorithm uh, when the training is happening right it is the values will come from the training data set right so you don't have to worry about that i can um, of course i can go ahead and manually fix the labels right so that's not the good way right because here you're passing the model is taking a number as an input right and you don't want to Uh, induce some human bias uh, in that input right so uh, if you come up with this construct so this is sort of uh, unbiased in a way okay. so string is very large and this uh, encoding will work uh, so one hot labeling so this is essentially one hot encoding because uh, so for each category you are coming up with a binary indicator right so for each category you are coming up with a variable which is a binary indicator so in this case for new york i'll have new york indicator and for florida i'll have uh, the value 0 or 1 right so all these indicators they are binary indicators and they can only take values ones and zeros depending upon uh, if that particular observation uh, take that value of uh, category right so this is what we also call as one uh, one hot encoding right or label encoding in a way Right, so are you guys able to understand why uh, we cannot go ahead with one, two, and three, and uh, and why should we go ahead and create the one hot encoding? Or right, so I hope this this should make sense, right? Because that is going to induce some bias because you are now manually fixing the labels, right? So you can add very large terms, right? So why just stick to one, two, three? You can add maybe thousand, two thousand, three thousand, right? So uh, it's all going to mess up your predictions, right? So. all right so let's move ahead now let's go to the implementation part so here i am creating these binary indicators right and here i am using a a, a a method available in the numpy library which is where and this is a pretty useful functionality so in whatever rows if my uh, state is new york so i am going to set the value 1 else 0 right so this is how you read it right so wherever the state is new york so put a value 1 else 0 right so i have already run this and let me check my data set again right so this is what the uh, data set looks like and now i have also dropped this column state right because i already have that information from these three variables okay so now my dependent variable is profit okay so i am going to uh, yeah create a variable called dependent variable and just assigning the string which is profit which is essentially the this variable name or the column name right so my independent variables will be essentially all these variables minus profit right so i can simply yeah run this so my independent variables are california state indicator marketing spend new york state indicator ind spend administration spend and florida state indicator right so we are going ahead with six variables right so now uh, <clears throat> so the first step is uh, we need to have the independent data set we need to have the de dependent data set or the dependent variable right so here we are creating the independent data set right so the, uh, here 
we're only taking those columns which are independent variables right and i'm calling dot values because this is going to give me a data frame but if i write dot values so this is going to give me an, an array right and uh, in the model we're going to pass the array only right so that's why i'm uh, right calling this method dot values which will convert this data frame which is this data frame to an array right similarly i can create a y which is your dependent variable so this is uh, so i've already uh, set my dependent variable here and i'm calling dot value so this is going to give me a, a, an array of uh, dependent variable values right so let's go ahead and run this right so so now pretty important thing right so uh, so now what we are going to do we are going to use something called train test split right so you already know this from earlier uh, as in i discussed this in the intro to machine learning right so firstly train test split is available from uh, here right so sklearn dot model selection so you can find this function train test split uh, in this particular module right so now what does train test split do right so so as i told you right so let's say you have uh, so initially let's say you have the total data set right so now what you need to do you need to decompose your uh, entire data set into two chunks okay so one will one is going to be train and the other is going to be test okay so the train data is what we are going to use to fit the uh, fit the model as in we'll only be using the train data set to learn the model parameters right so once we have done that so now we have the test data right so we can use the learned model or the trained model to make predictions on the test data as well and we can see uh, how our model is performing on the unseen data right because this is our task right what's the purpose of having a test data set in place because we want to see how our model is going to perform on an unseen data set okay because whenever you are let's say using your machine learning model in real time right so it, it is going to uh, get a real time value uh, inputs right and there you're going to uh, make some predictions right and then uh, once you have let's say the actual value information available so you can compare your predicted and the actual values and see how far far off your predictions were right so test data set is meant to uh, see or evaluate the performance of our model on any unseen data right so test data is essentially your unseen data set in this case right so that's the that's a set of observations which our model has not seen and we are going to use that test data set to uh, uh, evaluate our model so we'll be making predictions on the test data set and of course uh, we'll have let's say the actual values uh, in the test data too so we can compare how far our far off our predictions are right so that's the objective of doing the train test split but now a natural question arises so uh, what should be the uh, size of the train portion and the test portion right so usually what people do right so let's say this is your entire data set so this is your entire data set so what mostly people do that they will keep larger chunk as train and the smaller chunk as test okay so this could be around let's say 80% of data and the test will be 20% of the entire data set okay some people take 75% for train and the rest 25% for test right so usually here uh uh, people will uh, people go with 80 20 split so that is what we are also going to use so uh, so first let's understand this right part uh, i'll come back to the left part okay so this is the function and it takes x as input which is your uh, independent uh, uh, which is the array of independent uh, data set right and y is the array of dependent variable right and now here we need to specify the test size which is the proportion of the observations which are going to be in the test data set so here i am fixing 20% right so i am saying that uh, 20% will be in the test data set and the rest 80% uh, uh, is going to be in the uh, train right and of course uh, so which 80% of observations are going to go in the train so that will of course be de decided randomly right so in this case it's going to be decided randomly and then i have another variable called random state so 
the meaning of this will become clear in fact i can tell you now right so if you do not fix the random state so what can happen that whenever let's say you create a 20% let's say you do the trend test split so what will happen that maybe you uh, okay so I'll, let me just create a picture and you will be able to realize right so maybe let's say so i have let's say five uh, rows okay so this is uh, row number 1 2 3 4 5 okay so if i don't use random state so what will happen so let's say if i do uh, 80 20 split so let's say observation number 1 3 4 and 5 so they come in my bag of trained data set right and the remaining uh, second is going to be in my test right but let's say if i run this again so because this is happening randomly so in the in let's say if i rerun this again uh, so what will happen so that in my train i can have let's say two three four five and in my test i can have one right so if you don't want to get different observations every time let's say you rerun if you run that particular uh, step right so you can fix the random state so that will ensure that only uh, the same observations are uh, uh, pulled in your train and test bag okay so whenever you run let's say with random state zero or maybe any particular value so what will happen that one three and four and five they will always come in this particular train set so uh, essentially I, i'll come to the point of random state uh, later on as of now this is not required but uh, uh, they are essentially uh, a way to fix the seed okay or how so which random values we are going to take right so i'll uh, clarify the uh, all the details regarding the random state uh, maybe in uh, regularized linear regression okay so we are going to do some experiments later on so there uh, it, uh, it makes sense to uh, cover this particular topic right so i'll discuss this later on okay as of now this is not required just keep in mind that let's say if you set uh, what uh, the random state that means you are getting the same set of observations all the time uh, when you are running this piece of uh, code right so all those specific 20% of observations are getting in the test bag and the 80% is getting into in the train bag okay so and now what are these four uh, values so as you can imagine that this actually spits a tuple of four values so the first will be x train which will be the independent data set independent train data set x test will be independent test data set y train will be going to be uh, dependent train uh, or dependent variable uh, in our train data set right and y test is going to be the dependent variable of our test data set okay so of course these are all arrays okay so now next what we are going to do so once we have gotten our uh, x train x test y train y test so now what we are going to do we are going to do some transformation because uh, as alok had already pointed earlier that your variables should, uh, should be on same scale right because it might happen that let's say if your variables are not at scale so let's say if this value is pretty large as compared to this one so this will influence the prediction right so we want to have all the variables are on, on a similar scale uh, otherwise the predictions can get influenced by a particular variable which take let's say enormously large values okay so we are going to uh, uh, yeah scale our data set by using the min max scaler as in your transformed variable will be essentially be x max minus x x minus x min divided by x max minus x min right so you know this from earlier so i am creating an, uh, uh, an in instance of this class minmax scalar and storing in this object called scalar right and i am going to fit transform the scalar object on x train and on x test okay so before uh, you see the differences so let's say if i i keep this as x train and i can have let's say okay this is i have not run this okay so as you can see these are the first 10 rows and as you can see these are the values of the variables uh, for the first observation right and now let's 
do the transformation right so this is called scaling min max scaling and now let's see what our x train is now as you can see these values are not uh, now scaled and they lie between the uh, range 0 and 1 okay so you can choose uh, the other scaler so in fact you can go ahead with uh, the standard scaler as well as in the normal z transformation which is x minus mu by sigma but just for demonstration so uh, we need to do some sort of transformation of scaling so i went ahead with min, min max scaler right and the values will be between 0 and 1 okay but you can of course do the z transformation as well okay so now what we are going to do so now this is the most now uh, okay so i hope you guys are able to see the difference between these two right so before transforming and after transforming right so these values are pretty large but now all these values are uh, have been brought down to very smaller uh, scale which is between zero and one okay so now now this is a pretty important step right so okay so i'll just go above okay so in sklearn dot linear model module you have this uh, class which is linear regression okay so you have this linear regression class okay so that is what uh, what we are going to do we are going to create an instance of this class so so this is what i'll, st I'll be storing in regressive right so linear regression and of course there are some parameters right but i'm not uh, fixing them right so i'm not fixing them as of now of course i can set some parameters uh, based up, uh, upon my requirement but now i am not doing that right so i'm uh, taking all those default values right so regression is the instance of this class called linear regression okay so this is the regression object now once we have created this uh, instance we are going to uh, yeah so this is essentially our model object which is regression and we'll be calling this method called dot fit right which takes two argument one is x train and there is y train right so x is essentially your independent data set y train is your dependent data set right so this fit is essentially uh, this is where the entire training is happening right so if i just execute this right so execute this code so my model has been trained so internally uh, gradient descent is being uh, so uh, internally gradient descent is running but uh, we are not able to see that right of course you can write your own custom code implementation but this is what essentially the fit uh, function or method does right so regressor is your model object and you're fitting the model on this uh, train on training data set which consists of two components the independent part and the dependent part right so now let's see the uh, intercept of our model because our model is essentially in this case uh, of this form so beta naught is our intercept so let's see what the what is the value of beta naught is of course uh, and let's see what are the coefficients okay so the intercept is this particular value which is 44000 something like this and your coefficients are uh, 86.6 uh, and then this is pretty big so around 17 uh, so 17,000 something like this, right? So these are your coefficients. So this is the coefficient of this particular variable. So let's see what are the variables in uh, sequence we had. So so R and D spent. So whatever. Uh, so the coefficient for this particular variable is this one. Okay. So the so coefficient for R and D spent is this one. The coefficient for let's say administration is. Uh, in fact this should be in this particular order right so let me just check once what did we have in x okay. so that will give an, give us an idea as in the sequence of variables right uh, sorry so i've already created so maybe what i'll do i'll just write data set independent variables right right so so the first is california st state right so the first coefficient which you are getting here so this corresponds to that particular variable which is the california state indicator 
now let's talk about uh, so what's the other variable in sequence so that is now marketing spend so this is our x2 right and whatever the coefficient which you are getting here right so that is for uh, marketing spend right so similarly all those coefficients corresponds to these variables in sequence right so so these coefficients are essentially your betas right so now so now we have trained our model as in we have the model has learned these parameters which are betas that is in beta not beta 1 beta 2 all these betas so now what you can do so after training you can plug in these values in your equation as in now uh, you can plug in those corresponding values so now you have the model right so now you just need to plug in let's say any particular value of x1 x2 x3 x4 x5 x6 and then you can uh, get a prediction from that particular equation so this is what essentially the uh, so these are the attributes of regressor uh, object and intercept is another attribute for the regressor object right so it has two attributes here so co coefficient so coef underscore and then intercept underscore so these are the two attributes of your regressor object and this regressor object has been trained okay so essentially when i was saying you that uh, what is your model so your model is essentially your uh, uh, these betas right and this is what encoded in my model object which is regressor because it has so if i write uh, regressor so if i write regressor dot right so so now i, I have certain attributes like uh, co uh, coefficient and then let's say uh, intercept right so essentially your model parameters are what uh, are what that defines your uh, model right and of course you can have your coefficient here right so i hope you understand this particular point right so your model is nothing but just the betas in a way okay so once you know the betas you know the uh, functional form because you can plug these betas and whatever be the input value for these variables for that observation you can make a corresponding prediction for that startup right so if i give you a, a, a particular startup for which i let's say give you the values of marketing spend uh, invest rate that resides uh, all those information so you should be able to come up with a predicted predicted value right so now let's see what are the predicted values so let's say i want to make some predictions on the train data set first okay so of course i can uh, pass my uh, x train as the inputs and it will give me a list of values of the predicted uh, y's right so this is the predicted value for the y train right this is the predicted value for the second startup right this is for the third one fourth one and this is for the 50th one right so this is for so this is the predicted value and this is the actual value right this is the actual value so as you can see there are some differences this is 95764 this is 96778 right so now what you can do so you can uh, calculate the statistics such as let's say uh, mean squared error or root mean squared error by calculating the squared difference between uh, each observation of predicted and actual values and then uh, uh, add them up and then you can uh, divide them by a suitable factor okay so you'll get that matrix okay so of course we're going to calculate that now let's make some predictions on our test data set because this is not what the model has seen so let's see how it, how it's performing in the test data set okay so these are the predicted predicted values on the test data set and this is your actual uh, y right so this is i can write so actual profits on test data and this is the predicted profit on the test data okay so now we have a metric which you already know mean squared error so we can calculate this between uh, y test and y spread right and this is the mean squared error right uh, we can do the root mean squared error as well right so this is a nice metric to look at right because so this is the uh, root mean squared error uh, in your predictions on test okay so we are not controlling various parameters of gradient descent but it's automatically reaching the uh, 
uh, global minimum without the case of overshooting or undershooting so how it's happening right so of course taking the default values right so i told you here that uh, you can uh, yeah so if you just click on this right so you will be getting these right so fade intercept normalize copy x so there there could be some set of uh, uh, parameters or uh, yeah function parameters so you can explore these right but uh, uh, certain values are, so uh, the values are already set and uh, so those are using the default values essentially okay of course you can also uh, solve the linear regression problem by the normal equation right so i don't know if you guys have heard of the normal equation right so right so this is your normal equation and this is used in uh, so maybe i can just open this page right so you can also solve for your betas using this equation right so right so using this equation so you can read about the normal equation this is the analytical approach essentially okay so we are not going to bother about this as of now and you can have of course uh, a gradient descent uh, formulation as well for getting your uh, regression coefficients or training your model right so now uh, we can calculate the same for train as well because we calculated above right so we can do that so y train and we did not uh, convert yeah save that right so this is this is not what we said saved right so let's say this is y pred train okay so in this function we are going to pass two inputs one is your series of let's say predicted values and the other is going to be the series of uh, actual values right so this is going to be one y pred or oh, sorry this is of course for test and this is for train right so y pred train so so this is for uh, yeah for, for train performance and this is your test performance okay so let's see what this comes out to be so this comes out to be 9031 and across test this comes out to be 9137 so you can see that uh, the model is let's say the errors are more or less the same as in uh, the model is actually able to learn uh, and perform well on the test data set and of course you can calculate the r square right so you can see that it's 93.4 and if you do the same let's say for the train so let's see so what do you think guys uh, should we get higher r squared for train because that's the data which the model has seen right so it's 95 percent and in the case of test this is 93.4 percent right so there's not much difference between the two right so the model is doing of course it's learning on the train data set so it's doing well and of course uh, the model has learned well that's why it's performing uh, quite good on the test data set too okay so because the difference between your r squared or the mean squared error so it's pretty much the same right so the model is doing well right and uh, okay all right so this is how you get the model coefficients which are essentially the outcome of training that is what we mean by training as in to learn these model parameters right and yeah so that's pretty much it so i hope you guys were able to understand the basic linear regression implementation in which uh, we had multiple variables now of course our data set was pretty small but we can have uh, pretty large data sets as well okay